Hey everybody, Ren Carruthers here with a bonus edition of the Future Stars Forecast. I tweeted out earlier that I was going to have a very special guest and he did not let me down. I am talking about a award winning trainer. Yes, I had to put in the pun because what a week he has had. I'm talking about Wesley Ward. Let's go ahead and bring him on in. Add to the stream, here we are. Hi, how are you? First of all, I know you've had a crazy day. Tell our viewers about it. I, I flew back and forth across the country for this, uh, for my youngest son. Uh, he was up in, uh, in a camp in um, Utah. And uh, so we brought him back to his uh, boarding school in uh, Massachusetts. So he's, he was all excited to get from camp to his, see all his buddies and uh, it was a good day. Awesome. So now you're up uh, in Saratoga, right? Yeah, I, I dropped him off and um, with all his stuff and uh, went and bought him a big pizza for all of his pals and <laughs> jumped in the car and headed to Saratoga. Well, I hope you got I hope you got a slice at least, right? Yeah, I took one. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> one for the road. <laughs> so, I mean, my goodness, we already know your reputation, uh, especially. I mean, you're a great horseman all the way around, and I mean, from the fact that even going back, you used to ride, so. You really know a horse top to bottom, um, but your reputation really is with the two-year-olds. And what a week you just had. I, I mean, I would say that you have two of the very top two-year-olds of the season. We just saw Campanelli go ahead and win the pre-war knee. That was the third time you won that race. And prior to that, she became your 11th Royal Ascot winner, your eighth two-year-old to win at Royal Ascot. Um, so first of all, let's talk about her. In fact, sh let's watch the replay. And then I want to get your uh, feedback on what you felt about the trip and just how talented this filly actually is. So let's go ahead, check that out here. Share the screen. We're going to go ahead and get Caffinelli on screen here. Ready, racing. And Campanel has begun well in the yellow. Also on the inside, Nando Parado shows early pace. Acapulco gold out wider. Tactical goes into a forward position early, and they will follow them by the speedy lever shop going forward. On the outside, Wimble Shop and Rhythm Master in the center. They will follow then further back by Ken Gorm, and last of all, is far, far. So they go past the 800, and the leader is Campanelle, joined the way by more than a length. In second placing in the center, in the brown jacket is Lever Shop. Closer toward the near side rail is Nando Parado. Acapulco gold out wider. Coming in between horses is Ken Gorm in the purple with the green armbands. Tactical makes ground just in behind them. Rhythm Master was next, followed by Wimble Shop, and dropping right out of it is far, far. Down to the 400, and the leader Campanelli is shaken up. Acapulco Gold on the far side in the yellow and blue stripes is trying hard. In third placing then is Lever Shop, followed then by Nando Parado. But is this Frankie again? It's Campanelli kicking clear. Late on the scene is Nando Parado, but again, Frankie, champion at Deauville, and Campanelli wins. Campanelli ran away and won it well. Second home has gone to Nando Parado. <laughs> I, I mean, hello, what a filly. I, you, she's two years old. She has all those other fillies around her during the early part of the race. And then when it was time to go, Frankie just kicked her on so impressively. Uh, you know, it, it, it's you, you won this race with Lady Aurelia with the same connection, Stone Street and Frankie. So first of all, before we even get into Campanelli herself, what's it like to do it with a horse for the same, you've got the same crew going into this. Well, it's always great. Um, you know, Barbara is, uh, she's enamored with going to Europe and, and winning these races, which is really lucky for me, you know, <laughs> uh, um, you know, it, it puts a lot of uh, horses in my barn and, you know, some of them don't make it over there, but then you still have them for here. So, which is really, really nice. And, and I've been really lucky for them as well this year. So um, in the last few years, uh, so I just, um, and, and unfortunately she didn't get to go over this year cause she was mm -hmm. so looking forward to going to Ascot and to, to France, to this race. Uh, and, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's tough on that, you know, regard that she wasn't mm -hmm. able to get, go over there, but, um, you know, hopefully next year that 
you know, everything will open up and she'll get to go to ask it again, like she did with Lady Ray. What an impressive filly. I, I just you, when you look at her stride length, it looks like she could go farther, right? Yeah, I certainly think she can go a mile. She's got a big, long stride. I think, it, you know, a lot, lot came together this year that uh, with the ground being a little soft and she sort of has likes that uh, and others don't. So that was a little bit of an advantage. Uh, you know, she's got a big, long stride. She kind of reaches, you know, she's got a high reaching action there that gets over top of that soft ground that, that she can really get a hold of it and, and keep running. So, um, you know, that, that was a little bit in our favor. And uh, it was it was just really, really exciting. It was a great week. Well, it looks like she's actually won on firm, on good, and now soft. Uh, now, as far as the distance goes, like I said, it, it looks like she could go further. You have your options. The pre-morning was a win and you're in for the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Turf Sprint. Are you looking to go there, or are you maybe entertaining the idea of the Juvenile Turf Phillies? Or I know you have <laughs> no qualms about putting a filly in, you know, with the boys in the Juvenile Turf, potentially. Yeah, I, I just think the, is a mile is what she wants, um, you know, and, and um, you know, in talking with Frankie immediately after the race, that's when I like to talk to the riders, you know, to get their feel of of the horse and what they think they can do. And he was saying a mile is no worries at all, no issues. Uh, and I and I talked to Barbara and Ben McElroy and the whole Stone Street team prior to going over there about that. I said, this race will tell us just how far she'll go. Um, and usually... You know, even though horses will be become sprinters as they get older, at two, they'll run a mile. That's what I found. And um, the way she looks right now, you know, with that big, long stride, I don't think it'll be an issue. Can you actually going, you know, and speaking about a two-year-old and what you, what they are willing to do for you early on, you really have unlocked the key to that. Can you tell our viewers what you think it is that has given you the edge with two-year-olds in particular? Well, I start with most of them, especially the ones that I break uh, in October when we start breaking them. And you really, you know, I'm around them every day, all afternoon. In the afternoons is when I train the two-year-olds uh, throughout uh, October, November, December. And when, when these come down from <clears throat> Ian Brennan's, Barbara's, they, uh, from Stone Street in Ocala, you know, he'll give me a lot of insight as to what he thinks. But I get them so early. And I don't race a lot in the winter. I, I just kind of focus on the two-year-olds. I kind of shut a lot of these things down, especially this one after the Breeders' Cup with my better horses. I'll turn them out, give them a couple months, and then pick them back up after Christmas and and give them a couple of weeks of gallop and then start their work. So, I, you know, I'm, I'm not so uh, inundated with uh, racing in the wintertime, and I'm able to, to pay a lot of close attention to the two-year-olds. So it, it really helps me to get a good feel of them. Um, I used to start, you know, their little – short eighth of a mile breezes in January, years and years back. And I've cut it back now that I mean, almost their first works will be in March. Um, I don't even need to breeze them because they really, you know, the fast ones kind of come right to the top, you know, as far as the way they move and the way they look and mentally how they are, if they're more forward than the other ones. And so those are the ones that I focus on. And those particular ones will be the ones that I work the first week in March and then they run a month later. Uh, I don't do any speed works at all until then. Um, so I think it's just kind of being around them and then, and then knowing which ones you have. Well, you know, talking about the, the, the system that you have in place with this year and COVID and the racing calendar being pushed back, how did that affect your stable in particular? It really got me this year. You know, I, I, you know, sort of had everything in line and the faster ones, we moved up to, uh, Kentucky early you know, in, in February to sort of climatize and get ready for their first works in March. And um, boom, you know, they just kind of pulled the rug out from underneath me with uh, calling off Keelan so early. So I had to move some of these guys back down to Florida. And, uh, you know, I hate to go from a, a tropical climate up to Kentucky where it's freezing. You yeah. know, and then I'm, I'm sort of getting them used to being able to run there at Keelan, but also used to go in the ones that, you know, you're thinking about, hopefully they'll come through and they'll win. And then you'll go from that cooler climate on over to England. I had to come back down to Florida and it kind of reversed it. And it really didn't work out too well. I was having, you know, two to five, three to five shots get beat, finishing second, you know, and it just, uh, it really threw everything off, off, off key. It looks to me though, it, like the two-year-olds for you are hitting their stride. 
um, literally and figuratively. You you had other horses run in the money this week. Um, we we're talking about up in uh, Canada at Woodbine, you had two horses running the money in the stakes race that they had for the two-year-olds there. Um, you also had a, a filly run third in the Bolton Landing. Um, all the names right now, there's so many of them kind of escape me. I have to look back at my notes here. But it, it looks like they're starting to, you, you got them sort of on 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 point for what you're looking for. Yeah, they're, they're coming out. You know, it might have been a blessing in disguise. They're all kind of coming out a little bit later on. I was able to take my time with them. Um, you know, in Canada, the the two, the Colton affiliate that I ran up there, you know, one was second into the sunrise. That's and my, my great buddy, uh, Gatewood Bell's Philly, Illegal Smile. Was Illegal was Smile, third. that's it. <laughs> and uh, she ran a great race. because And both of them pace setters. Yeah, yeah. They were we know your horse is great. They would fill me. So, you know, I, I think that uh, both will stretch out to a mile with no problem as well. That, see, it's like an embarrassment of riches, right? But going back to Campanelle or Campanelli, um, when you when you first got her to the barn, it, it, she's got a really interesting pedigree to me. She's bred by Tally Hostad. She's an Irish bred. She's by Kodiak. Kodiak himself wasn't, you know, this world beater, but. That being said, he's a you know a champion sire of two year olds. He's uh, has Group One winners like Fairyland and Best Solution, um, and he's a three quarter brother to Invincible Spirit. So right there, that's great pedigree. Um, and then the bottom side, she's her dam is by a Group One winner in the Mead. Uh, what were your first uh, impressions of her when she came to the stable? Was she, I mean, from the temperament to the confirmation? Did you already have plans, and did you already recognize? group one winning talent in her when she came down um she sort of set herself apart you know once you know she sort of settled in and started galloping and um early on at palm meadows she you could really tell like yeah. this was the one you know this was she was she was you know, sort of like um you know an, an, a high school athlete that looks like you know this plan and uh you, you say well the, you know he or she should be in college playing you know and that that's the way she looked <laughs> She just sort of stood out because, you know, she was so big, but so athletic um, and mentally she's so relaxed as well. You know, that that means a lot, especially with two year olds. You know, she sort of takes everything in um, when she got back from Ascot. It's usually not the trip over to Ascot that they it kind of taxes them. But on the way home um, after going, running uh, and then and then shipping back, they got to come back through uh, Arlington Park and uh -huh. spend. 48 hours in quarantine there and then come back to, to Keeneland, you know, you look at them and wow, that really kind of takes a toll on them, you know, and then they, and then a few days later, they'll kind of sponge back out and put all their yeah. weight back on. But uh, this filly, uh, Barbara was there actually the first day she got back. You would never know she left. She was wow. just, just big and perfect. I mean, you would never know she ran. You never know. It was just, she's amazing, really easy going, relaxed filly, just, you know, just uh, nothing, nothing really bothers her. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a, it's a, it's a, you know, these, these horses are, are few and far between. So I'm so lucky and grateful to have them in my barn. Oh yeah. And you know, one of the things I thought was so interesting also about her pedigree uh, is the fact that uh, being by Kodiak, who is uh, by Dane Hill, Dane Hill himself is already inbred to Natalma. The, uh, and for those of you who don't know out there watching, Natalma is the dam of Northern Dancer. Um, so he, Dane Hill's already inbred to Natalma. And then on the bottom side, with her dam being by Namid, Namid, uh, he is, his, dams, his dam is by um, Tate's Gallery, who's a full brother to Sadler's Wells. So another son of Northern Dancer. And so then you get another instance of Natalma. So I just thought that was really interesting, all of that in the pedigree there. Um, but, you know, when you have a class blue hen and you're a pet geek, why wouldn't you be excited, right? <laughs> but so going forward now, I saw that you were entertaining the idea of putting her in the Shovely Park. Well, I nominated her just to keep the options open. We tried that with um, Lady Aurelia and uh, had my assistant trainer Frankie over there at the time. And, you know, it, it just, uh, it didn't work out, you know, the, yeah. and it never usually does when I try to do that because some of the races were close together. You think, well, why bring them back home and, and then go back again? And uh, the various times I've tried it, it's 
never worked out even with the great lady Aurelia. Um, so that's why when they run well, pretty much all the horses come back unless for some reason they, I scratch and then say Maven, for example, he scratched at Ascot and I, I ran him in, um, in, uh, uh, Shanty and, uh, he won a group three there because he didn't get a chance to run. Um, but you know, leaving him there didn't work, work out as well. So uh, when he ran back, so I, I like to bring them home and give them a couple months between races and then they can always go back and they, and they do very, very well. They do, they do really well back in their own, their own stall and, you know, where they've been trained and where they feel comfortable with and, and yeah. how I feel comfortable training as well. Um, yeah. You know, just Aiden O'Brien, you know, he, he brings his horses back and forth every day because he <laughs> wants them sleeping in the same stall that they left in. Yes. And I can see why now. Yeah, yeah. No, can you explain actually to our viewers? Because I think a lot of people, you know, I grew up on a farm. Obviously, you've been around horses all your life. Um, I, I don't know that they necessarily understand just to the extent that horses truly are routine oriented. They are. They get used to a routine, and um, if you take it out of the routine, you can really tell. You know, if you're around them all, you know, all the time, um, and you take them out of their routine, you know, a lot of horses lose weight. Um, I, uh, for example, I have, I have a horse that I own bound for nowhere. And I, uh, unfortunately they, they shut the, the grass works down oh. in, um, Keelan and he's a big guy and he's, uh, fragile. So I took him to Arlington, to my barn at Arlington just for eight days. He went up on a Friday, he worked Saturday, and then he stayed through the week to work another Saturday. And, uh, Julio Garcia, I flew him in to work him both times as he rides him and he's worked him every every time of his life. And the second time he he when we <clears throat> pulled him out for Julio to get on the second week after he'd been there for eight days, he goes, Wesley, he said, he looks smaller, <laughs> meaning that he lost weight, you know. Oh, no. <laughs> so he just, you know, th those things, uh, you know, and we got him back and within two days of being back at Keeneland, he put all his weight back on. It, it really is amazing. I, you know, I got to pop this comment up because I think you'll get a kick out of it. Great trainer, great smile. <laughs> and why wouldn't you be smiling? Again, it, you, it's, it's just a great stable you have um, as we're looking ahead to Future Stars Friday. One of the things you, we should mention is, I think a good example of what you're talking about is the horse coming back home, Hootenanny ran second in the pre-morning back in 2014, was it? And then he went ahead and won the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Turf. Yeah, with Frankie. With Frankie. Can you talk about that relationship with Frankie, by the way? I think our, we all get a kick out of Lanfranco de Torre. But how did the relationship develop? And, I mean, with your background in riding, do you give him pointers on if, if he didn't do something just the way you would have had it done yourself? <laughs> Uh, you know, actually, I, I really don't give any jockeys instructions. I may give them a little insight to the horse, but uh, for the most part, I find out that the, if I give them an instructions, they try to ride to that, and then the race will come up completely different. So, you know, you got to kind of trust the guy, the rider on the horse, and that's, you know, I, I, I'm pretty selective when it comes to that. You know, I ride a few certain guys, but uh, for example, you know, Johnny Velasquez, I've rode him forever. And I never gave him one instruction ever to ride a horse. Uh, just, you know, you, you put someone like that uh, on a horse, you, you know that they're going to they're gonna ride their best. And, and they're, they're going to, you know, the only thing I will do for him is give him a little insight if the horse, you know, leans in or gets out or uh, if he makes a lead too soon or something like that, you know, or something little idiosyncrasies about the horse. But other than that, I, I never give instructions. So how did it start? There's a great story. I know this story between you and Frankie, that friendship. Well, there's, first of all, he's a very funny guy. You know, he's, yeah. uh, you know, off the track. If you were to go to dinner with him, you, you, you're just uh, sitting back and you're the audience and you'll, you'll, you'll have to hold your stomach the rest of the night because uh, he's <laughs> so funny. Um, he's a real animated guy. And, uh, you know, he's, he's the, 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 the center of attention. That's for sure. You know, and you, 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 you want to let him have it because he's, he's a, he's a great character. Um, but beside that, he's unbelievable talent. You know, he's, he is where he is for a reason. That's um, for sure. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, a lot of jockeys and trainers, uh, myself being one early on, you know, you'll, you get to big races and you'll do things different than you would have, you know, and, and it's just, it's, it's essentially, they're all just horse races, you know, they're all, mm -hmm. and so you, you really got to do, 
uh, for the, train that horse just like you were going to train them, no matter if it was an allowance race or if it was whatever the Breeders' Cup. Um, so you don't you don't want to change. And Frankie, he's been there so many different times. He's he's got a plan, and you know if the plan changes during the race, he'll adapt to it. But yeah, he's just he's just phenomenal jockey. Well, I, it's exciting to see you teamed up again and again with a filly that's this exceptionally talented. Um, we actually have another question for you here from Stephanie. She says, does Wesley enjoy the American racing or European racing more? Uh, you know, when I first went over, I was enamored by the European racing and, you know, I had instant success. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I started, I didn't know anything about it when I first went to, um, to Ascot. Um, I rode there as, as a jockey, uh, for a short time in Italy. And, um, but, but I, I was removed from all the big races as we all are, or as we all were. Um, but now, you know, racing's getting smaller with the internet and everything that's going on. Everybody kind of knows what everybody's doing. Um, and you know, it's, it's easier to follow the circuit now. Um, but, uh, I don't know. I, you know, it, uh, as I'm, as I'm, as if I was younger, you know, I, I might want to even try venturing over there and training over there, but now I got gray hair. I think I'll just stay where I'm at and, go over and hopefully continue success if I get lucky. Well, it wasn't like the first time you went over for, you know, Royal Ascot and you got fitted for the, the coat and tails and, or the hat and tails. Um, you know, I, I, I had a lot of success with the two-year-olds early and um, we really only had a couple of early type stakes, one being on Kentucky Derby Day. And I just thought for a couple of years, I knew about ask it a little bit that they had you know two-year-old racing over there and i kind of looked at it a little bit and then one time i, I you know when I, the year i went i thought let me give it a try and so we made arrangements to go and uh, when i got there um i didn't really know what to expect of course you think you think you could win uh yeah. and then the first day of you know they, they had to take you around and tell you what to do uh, as far as you know get the the top hat and the tails and you know and and uh, how everything works and uh you know, shipping the horses into the race that day and bringing them up to the paddock. And so we did all that. And then we got there and you're looking around, and you see all these guys, you know, everybody's in the top hat and tails. And you think, <laughs> What's going on? You know, it's kind of, it, it feels kind of weird. You know, now it's no big deal at all, but it, you, you feel like you're, you're, you know, and everybody's with English accents. And, yeah. Um, you kind of feel like you're in a movie or something. Did you get a Pimm's cup? Uh, didn't start though. I, I was drinking <laughs> champagne though. <laughs> oh, of course, of course. Right. Yeah. So, oh my uh, goodness. And then when, when I won, um, actually I, I lost the first race I ran for Mr. Ramsey and I thought, oh man, this is just going to be, a you know, it'll be an experience. I put it that way, you know, instead of an embarrassment, I thought oh, it'll be a little bit of an experience. And, um, the next race we won. And then the following day we won the Queen Mary. So it was, oh. uh, it was like, you couldn't believe it, you know, and, uh, and we kept going back again and again and again. And, uh, you sort of find the races and the horses for each race and the distances, the horses alike, and you figure out which ones to bring over and which ones, you know, certainly won't. So it's, it's a big, been a big learning experience and I'm still learning. Oh, how's Kamari doing? She put in a game second place finish for you at, at this Royal Ascot, right? She did. Uh, she ran great. You know, unfortunately, she got left at the starting gate. That's kind of one of her things that she does. And she just couldn't make up the ground there. Um, but she's, she's getting ready. We're, we're thinking about either the Prioress or, you know, a lot will depend on Sunday's work, um, which direction we're going to go, or uh, one of the Kentucky Downs races. It's, a lot depends on this next work at uh, Keeneland on Sunday. Well, I'm excited to see what she does. As I've told you in the past, I have a soft spot for her, not only from the talent that she showed, but also because tail female wise, she's related to a horse that uh, my family used to own. So there's sort of a, I just feel an extra connection to her because that was a very special horse to us. Um, so like I said, um, Kamari, for those of you who, who are unfamiliar, put her in your stable mail because she is a beast. She, how big actually, she looks so tall to when I've seen photos of her. She's a big filly. She really is. She's yeah. And I, I really look forward to racing her again next year. I think she's going to be equally, if not better as a four-year-old. 
That's exciting to hear. Um, so we actually have more questions for you coming in. And first of all, Ricardo Fuentes here says, hello from Puerto Rico. And his question to you is, what is the best horse that you've had in your life? Oh, I've had some good ones. That's a tough question to answer, you know. <laughs> Lady, Lady Aurelia was certainly um, accomplished a lot. You know, she's, yeah. she was great. Um, but I've, I've had a lot of great horses over the years. Um, you know, I had a horse back when I first started training. And, uh, he, you know, you always kind of need one horse to get you going. His name was Unfinished Simp. And he was a really, really good horse. And at the time, I'd only been training a couple, two, three years into my career and didn't know really what I was doing uh, to have a horse of that magnitude, you know, and to start him out. Uh, I bought him at a two-year-old sale for thirteen or $14,000. And uh, he earned, uh, I don't know, close to 700000 and um, just was narrowly beaten in the Breeders' Cup mile and won all these stakes races. And he was a really, really good horse. I think if I had him today, he didn't been even better. But, um, you know, that, I've had a lot of really good horses over the years. Judy the Beauty, of course, was a oh, yeah. uh, champion, um, Clips Award winner, yeah. Breeders' Cup winner. Yeah. So, um, there, you know, there's, there's, it's, it's tough to say which one. And I love when I asked you about how she got her name. You said just because of how she looked, right? <laughs> uh, she is a beautiful horse. And she was named <laughs> at, actually, she was named after uh, my mother's uh, best friend, Judy. So, Oh, that's sweet. Okay, we have another question for you from Kyle Glynn. What's the best cue that a two-year-old will stretch out to a mile? I'd say um, mentally, you know, if they're when they go to the track and they have to kind of be easy on themselves in the mornings and um physically they'll have to have a, a bigger horse a bigger mm -hmm. two-year-old with a longer stride there you go um somebody's asking how maven came out of the race he came out perfect um i think the the winner kind of pulled a heart out of him there at about the mm. turn for home oh okay well so long safe and sound back in the barn all good we can live on to fight another day. Now we need to talk. Oh wait, we have one more question. And then I want to get to talking about golden pal. Let's see here. Mark wants to know if you're going to be running more at Woodbine. Um, I, I should have some more horses coming up and some stakes here. The last part of the meet. It's difficult now with the, uh, you know, getting over and, and back and forth across the border and help and everything like that. So that's making the uh, travel a lot, uh, a lot more uh, tough to deal with. Yeah, I hear you. Yeah, for sure. Now, I, I have to address somebody here, Robert, who says that I'm the first person to see have sh horseshoes on the wall hanging the wrong way. All the luck runs out when you hang them up that way. Well, actually, you can put them one way or the other. I normally would never put a horseshoe upside down on a wall, but because it's a pair of shoes, and actually those shoes are dialed in shoes. So I wanted it to look like he was crawling up the wall. So that's why they're hanging that way. <laughs> okay. Right. And besides, I'm not superstitious anyway. Are you superstitious? It seems like everybody in racing except for me is. A little bit. A little bit. Okay. Because I'm always, Matt, for example, he, I mean, he's not to this degree, but he's a little superstitious and he knows players who they want to go to the same teller or they have to watch on the same monitor. And I know there are trainers. They have to stand in the same spot, right? To watch mm -hmm. a race. I'm always of the opinion, wow, it takes a lot of ego to think that if you weren't going to that same teller or standing at the same monitor, that everything the trainer did, the horse did, the jockey's going to do, you've undone it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. But um, in, in any case, let's talk about Golden Pal. Actually, why don't we go ahead, check out the Skidmore, and then we'll get your feedback on it. Let's see here, share screen. We're going to go to share audio. Go here, Golden Pal. Start it. There in the gate. And they're off. Hesitant start for number two of Eight Town Bear. And he's at the back of the pack. Golden Pal quickly to the frontier. Big favorite Golden Pal already in front by two and a half lengths. Fauci is running in second, Kentucky Knight. Now towards the hedge, next and third. Then Sky's Not Falling in fourth. 
followed by the Philly Sunny Isle Beach in fifth, and the B-Town Bear is the trailer. The quarter, 21 and four-fifth seconds. Golden Pal, the leader, midway around the far turn. It's Golden Pal by two. Fauci runs in second, and Sky's not falling on the outside, picking up some ground now from third. And Kentucky Knight is fourth, followed by Sunny Isle Beach. The field is in the stretch, and it is Golden Pal in hand here with an eighth of a mile to the finish. Golden Pal opening up here by almost five lengths. Golden Pal will get his maiden victory in Saratoga Skidmore Stakes, and he did it impressively. Fauci was second. Sky's not falling, finished third. The time of the race, one minute and four-fifth seconds. Okay. Okay. That has been the performance of all two-year-olds for me of the season thus far. That was unbelievable. He got a 92 buyer for that effort. That puts him right on the top of the figures leaderboard. Um, and the thing about this horse, and this is what's so exciting too, because I was reading this article for from Horse Racing Planet written by John Lees. And he had this quote from Kieran Fallon, champion jockey, who was helping uh, watch over your horses over there when they went for Royal Ascot. So Gold Pal, he was second in the Norfolk to the Lear Jet. And he, you know, just as he did here in the Skidmore, he got the lead and just in those final strides, Learjet just got him, right? And prior to that, he had uh, debuted actually on dirt. And, and the same thing had happened where he just got caught. But in any case, after the Norfolk Stakes, there's this quote from Kieran in that article in which he, I know you guys were kind of entertaining maybe going into the Nunthorpe against older horses, including champion sprinter Batash. And Kieran said, if that horse goes, I think he wins. A two-year-old beating Batash. I mean, talk about the faith in him. So I, this is not crazy what we then saw him do in the Skidmore. No, he's you know, he's a very talented horse. He always has been. I, I didn't I had never breezed him, and I always said that uh, you know, just the way he moves and to be around him and his demeanor, um, that he'll end up being, if not the best horse I train, one up for sure. I mean, he's, wow. uh, I've said that early, early on. And, you know, a lot of, you'll hear a lot of jockeys say that, oh, this is the best horse in the, you know, and it, this horse is for real. And um, I've, uh, I, I, I think, uh, I don't want, I'm not going to run him again until the Breeders' Cup. I don't think he has to run again. He's just, you know, <laughs> if you, you know, the, and they're so fast and that, that, you know, you got to try to keep these things together. That's the reason why I don't want to, I don't want to run again until the Breeders' Cup. And I've already talked to the owner about next year's schedule. And you know, if we're so lucky to, that we can win that, um, you know, we're going to keep him right there at Keeneland, right in my tobacco barn, where I keep him all through the winter and then bring him back. And uh, I, I love Turfway Park. That's very kind and forgiving uh, surface on the horses. I've never heard a horse in all the thousands of horses I've worked or ran over it's an amazing place to, to, to bring all my good horses come back there to do all their, their workouts. And, you know, he'll run in the spring at, uh, at Keeneland and hopefully go to, uh, to next, the following year to, to Royal Ascot. So I'm just, I've, I've already planned for, for next year for this guy. Uh, he is just so powerful looking out there. I can't remember who it was the old school. It was either old school trainer or it was, Tessio himself, uh, the, I, I cannot remember, but somebody said the ideal stride on a horse is when it, they look like a ballet dancer out there. They just flip those legs out and minimal action uh, being wasted. And he just looks like he's throwing those legs out there and swallowing the ground up. Yeah, he's uh, he's he's very intelligent horse too. He's very, very smart. And um I, I said in one of the articles, he, he, you know, his uh, to be around him, he'd be like the, you know, like a Tom Brady type guy, you know, as a as a as a high school player, you know, he, he's he can already see what he's going to be, and he's a real cocky dude, you know, he's, <laughs> he really is. He 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 comes out of that stall, and he'll, you know, he's not mean at all, but he's very, you know, he's very studdish, but but not not in a bad way, just that he knows he's he's it, and. Uh, you know, he's, he's uh, these horses are all like he knows, you know, 
it's one of my all time favorites. So I'm always up there with him, giving him candies, or you know, I, I hold on to his nose. And the more, uh, you know, and, and uh, if, if you don't, he'll try to give you a, a bite in a, you know, in a nice way. <laughs> but, but if you hold on to his nose, you know, yeah. I, I, and the owner he has is uh, a nightmare. I'll tell you that the guy is half a nightmare. And I said, it's a good thing you got a good horse because he, he calls and he calls, you know. Oh my but God. But I knew this horse was going to be something. And I enjoy I. I put him on a FaceTime. I see the horse, but if I hold it under his nose, you can pet him. You can do that. Oh. As soon as you turn loose of the nose, oh, he'll try to bite. Oh. You. He's a really cool, 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 cool horse. He's really a neat guy. Well, what a Breeders' Cup pedigree he has as well. Golden Pal is the son of Uncle Mo, who won the 2010 Breeders' Cup Juvenile. He was named Eclipse Champion, two-year-old male. Then he's the first full out of Randall Lowe's Lady Shipman, and what a freaky fast filly she was on grass. Um, we know just the you know really solid resume she put together. In fact, she was very close to having won the Breeders' Cup Turf Sprint um, back in what was it, 2015? And so the you know I actually she had gone to Dubai as well to try to contest the El Cause Sprint. I, I spoke with Randall there. And he spoke with such passion for this horse. So it's gotta feel even um, more rewarding to, to now see the progeny have this type of talent. Um, and then another, I gotta give another shout out also because Lady Shipman herself is by another Breeders' Cup champion in Midshipman who won the 2008 Breeders' Cup Juvenile and was Eclipse champion juvenile male. Um, so again, what, what, what a tremendous pedigree right off the bat. Well, this guy's equally as well on the dirt. Um, he's That's very what you did. did you want to see what your options were first, or no? Uh, he's just so fast, and you know, when you get a two-year-old that's that's as fast as he is, they're so fragile. It's just it's a lot more forgiving surface to grass right yeah. now. But um, you know, at some point in his three-year-old year, year uh, late, uh, I, I wouldn't mind trying the dirt. And not even trying. I'm already. I already know what he can do. <laughs> but you know, he, he would run so fast, he'd probably hurt himself. He's just. He's amazing, amazing horse. Oh, I know. He looked like a rocket. Just once uh, Arad hit the button to go, it was really, really impressive. And I, I can't stress that enough to anybody out there who's watching. Now you won the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Turf Sprint last year with Four Wheel Drive. Are you pointing him to the turf sprints just with all the speed that his yeah. dance imparting? Okay. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. I, I don't know who at this point could go with them. I just don't know. Fauci was great in there as well. You also trained Fauci, uh, appropriately named, uh, given what's going on in the world right now. Uh, Fauci was, I mean, yes, his stable mate beat him by, what is it, three and a half lengths, but he was four and a half, four lengths in front of the third place finisher. And he's got a great pet pedigree too. He's by Malibu Moon, and then he's out of Tash Zara who um, is by Intikhab, uh, who is a champion miler in Europe. And then she's a half sister to grade one winners, Acceleration and Lancaster Bomber. So really nice pedigree there. A horse that when I looked on the paper, on paper, I thought, well, maybe this is a horse we see in the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Turf. Yeah. Um, we, we've got him pointed right now to go to the races down there at Kentucky Downs. He's nominated to the sprint and mile as well. Um, He's already back in in Keeneland, uh, so you know in the next next little next week or two we'll decide as to which race he's going to go in. Um, so, but uh, he came out of the race equally as well, perfect, no problems. So, um, you know, we're, we got, things are going really really good right now. We're going to talk to Philip Antonacci who bought the horse for his father and for Aww. Dave Reed, and um, as we get a little closer, we'll decide which one of the two races we'll go in. Who named him? Uh, Philip did. And has has anybody reached out? Uh, everybody. You know, they, they you know they always call me. How do we get a hold of the you know who should we? Do? I said Philip Antis. So he, I I steer all the the media to him, and uh, so he's funny. having a good run. He, he he picked a good one there. Yeah, for sure. So we have more questions for you. Uh, let's see here. So I want to ask, hello, Mr. Ward. Who is your go-to jockey for any horse at any time of your career? Um, I've had a lot of success with, uh, Johnny, had a lot of success with Frankie, had a lot of success with Joel, now a lot of success with Irad, uh, early on, a lot of success with Chris Antley. 
So um, it's 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 hard to say. Uh, they're all great. Um, you know, I sort of it's kind of like all sports. You know, the guy there. It's who's ever you know in golf, who's ever doing well or calling. You know, it's a, it's all instant decisions. So the guys that are doing the best, or you know, initially is who you're going to go with, mm-hmm. and then I always try to keep them on the horses, stick with the horses because they they'll know the horse at that time. So I try to keep the rider, this, that same rider on the horse. You know, I'm just curious because, you know, with with your international perspective, I'm curious if you watched um, the Del Mar handicap the other day. And did, if so, if you saw the move that Umberto Raspoli put in to win and beat United, because he, he, he hit the go button on Red King before United uh, w- was put into position to go. And everybody's been just commenting on the fact that, you know, here he's come over um, from riding over in actually Hong Kong, I think. Uh, didn't Miss Foley ride in Hong Kong? Yeah. Um, so so he's kind of coming in with a different playbook and catching some of these guys off guard. So I don't know if you saw that or not. So I'm sorry if I'm catching you off guard, but I, you know, I thought it was really just the, the chess playing there was was very interesting. I didn't see the race, but I know him very well. Um, he got on Lady Aurelia for me um, in the mornings. He's a great friend because he's really? Italian and Frankie's. And when I was in France um, and I had dinner with him and his wife, whose uh, father is Gerard Mosse. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, he's, a, he's a jockey that I I didn't know, but we uh, sort of li- Frankie lined up a dinner for the three of us. And we, we had a real, real good talk about uh um, racing, you know, and as long as, as Gerard, as many races he's won all over the world, uh, it, was a, it, was a, it was a great dinner. Oh, my gosh. Oh, you know, so, so you mentioned Lady Aurelia again. I should mention um, Ava, the, one of, she was one of the first two horses that she actually has ever touched. Um, we happened to be at the sale grounds when she went before she went in the ring and sold for obscene money back to Barbara Banky. And and uh, we took some photos with her. And she was so sweet. Was she always sweet in the barn? I'm curious. Yeah. 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 She was yeah, she's uh different than than Barbara's Philly now and then Campanelli, but uh, she she was a little more compact, just total speedball but a real sweetheart in the barn as well. Oh my gosh. Um, I, again, just such an impressive resume and so talented too. Um, so we actually have another question for you. Are there any two-year-olds that you haven't raced yet that you're excited about? I do have some two-year-olds coming up that haven't, uh, you know, unfortunately they've gotten rained off at Saratoga um, in the yeah. maiden turf sprints. Uh, so I, I think we'll probably get carried over to, Kentucky Downs and then it's a little you know there's so many horses that go into the races uh, a lot of times you only get you, you have to get lucky to get in so it's it's backing me up now do you have to have a certain type of horse mentally to run at Kentucky Downs because as we all know the undulating turf course I think it helps to, uh, to for a horse that has had a start you know um, to go there as opposed to yeah. first time starters Right. But certainly, right. if you have a talented horse, it uh, it doesn't matter. It's a uh, it's a great place. It's a very safe place too for the horses. Um, as far as you know, all the horses that I've run have have come back really good. I've run you know a lot of my my really really good horses there. So I'm I've always been excited about that. It's a it's a cool place to be too. You know, it's like you go to a yeah. county fair and you're racing for a jillion dollars, so you can't beat it. <laughs> <laughs> right on. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, now, I don't know about this because I haven't seen what the numbers were, and I don't know if you follow Ragazins, but Darren Sipes wants to know, are you surprised that Tony's heart received a bigger, better Ragazin figure than Golden Pal? For those of you who don't know, Tony's heart, or Toby's heart, Philly won the Bolton Landing, and I would actually be surprised that that would be the case because to my eye, I mean, it's pretty clear who looks dominant. Not, not to take anything away from the Philly, but... I, I just don't know. <laughs> um, well, the day that Toby's heart ran, it was a heavy track. So I think that comes into when they finalize that number. Yeah. Um, my great friend, Brian Lynch, owns and trains that filly as well. Mm-hmm. So, um, and I know he was very, very confident going into the race. 
because I had the filly that was third in, in the race with him. Yes, um, Amanzi Yimpilo. Yimpilo, yeah. <laughs> um, so it, uh, as we move forward, uh, I'm sure we're going to see which one of the which one of the two is better. <laughs> right on. I, it'll, it'll be a friendly rivalry and something for which to look forward to. I, you know, you've had so much success, like we, as we've discussed. I, I, I mean, oh, wait, we've got another question for you. From Darren again. Any opinion on whether the European monster Gaia would compete in the Breeders' Cup Classic? I think he meant to put Gaia there, but you, you, I, I think that horse could handle dirt. A uh, few have done it. And right. And I, I don't think Keeneland's the best place to for, for a European horse to try the dirt. Um, I was great buddies with Bobby Frankel, and he always said that uh, – that the California tracks are a lot more conducive to the European horses that try the dirt than in the Eastern tracks, mm -hmm. it, at, least, at least initially. So um, I think you should stick to the turf. <laughs> <laughs> well, like you're saying, we have seen for uh, back in was it 2000, uh, Giants Causeway came over with second to Tis Now in the classic uh, declaration of war. So in that photo finish with Mucho Macho Man and Will Take Charge got third. Um, but yeah, we've seen it. And yeah, why not play to your strengths, right? Uh, let's see here. We have a question from Jim Harrington. Her Harrigan. Are you the Wesley Ward that was a jockey and competed for a title years ago against Angel Cordero? That was me, 100 pounds ago. <laughs> By the way, I should mention, and Hell or Angel, as, as we Americans are, are more prone to say, um, he is going to be the featured guest on tomorrow's Cocktails and Conversation on Breeders' Cup social media, hosted by Brittany Erton and Nick Luck. So you're going to want to check that out. I got to tell you, one of my all-time favorite races is actually a race in which the horse lost. And I am talking about the 1978 um, Jockey Club Gold Cup, Slew and Exceller. I mean, that race, the guts that were laid out that day, incredible, right? That was a great race. <laughs> oh, and I, you know, one of the things I didn't even under, know about it previously, because I actually had the um, honor of speaking with Angel about it, I didn't realize he had lost one of the stirrups uh, coming on the backside. I, I, I didn't even know that, so it made it even more incredible to me. I, can you can you actually uh, tell our viewers how hard that is when you when you lose your balance on a horse and just how big of an impact it can have on them? Well, you lose your you know you, it's not that you lose your balance is that the horse will get off stride because you know you're sitting there and you know to be a good jockey is to be a good passenger and when you lose your stirrup and you bounce off the saddle and then the horse will take off and then you got to readjust everything and take him back. So I never do that as well. So yeah, and isn't it nuts? It's nuts. Oh, we got another question for you. Favorite track for the Breeders' Cup? Whoops, you may have just answered that. <laughs> Certainly. Keeneland. <You're> back, yeah. <laughs> Keeneland. Yeah. Now, how do you feel that you have an advantage even more so, apart from the fact that your horse looks like, you know, a gangbuster? Uh, do, do you feel like that, that you train in this backyard here? So this is, this is his turf, literally and figuratively. <laughs> Uh, I really do this year. Um, each and every spring and fall, you know, wherever my horses are running prior, when you see the numbers or, or of my horses, when it comes to a Keeneland meet, they always jump up a level just because, you know, it's just like any sport when you're, you know, when you're, when you're playing the home, there's, there's a reason why, you know, you got a home team advantage or home court advantage. Um, so I, I think this year I, you know, hopefully everything goes well and I can get the horses there. And if they do get there um, in great shape and and uh, I think I'll have a, a big advantage. That's so exciting. Do you have any um, favorite, some, are you a burgoo guy or will you take the, the bread pudding over the burgoo? Neither. <laughs> Neither. Neither. Is there something else there that tantalizes the taste buds that we don't know about? Um. I wouldn't say that Lexington is known for its 
culinary food, but um, you talk about it. I go to the Cracker Barrel. I'm so happy. <laughs> but uh, there's a there's a few certain restaurants in town that that, that I like. You know, I, I kind of sort of get fixated on on uh, one or two. But they, they but uh, um, you know, it's just a, such a beautiful place. It really is. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think it's the it's my favorite track, anyways. It's beautiful. I as a kid, I grew up going there with my parents. We drive down from Michigan. We go to the sales. And Keeneland, to me, as a little girl, you look at it and you think that you're you're on some you know at some castle because of the, the beautiful stonework and everything. So in my mind, you, you kind of had it um, as a memory of going to some fairy tale type land. And so it, yeah, I agree with you. It's so beautiful. And uh, this will be the second time that's hosted Breeders' Cup 2015. We're I, I'm, that 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 was just so incredible. I'm sure. I mean, not only did we see history made because the Breeders' Cup itself did not run for the first time until 1984. So no Triple Crown champion had had an opportunity to run in it. And so we saw American Pharaoh be the first to have the opportunity to win the classic after having won a Triple Crown. And he put in what I would think is the best performance of his career. Were you on the apron or anywhere close by when he ran? Uh, no, I was up in the Coolmore box and I watched it and it was, uh, I was really amazed by the whole Friday, Saturday you know, yeah. and the way that, uh, that it was run. I, I, I didn't think that Keeneland would be able to handle that sort of crowd or capacity you know, <laughs> that, that, that uh, people that came in yeah. and it really was amazing the way that it just was seamless, how everybody came in and went out and there wasn't, uh, it went off like fantastic. You know, I was, uh. It was, it was, it was great. Every, I hope everything goes well as far as yeah. weather's concerned. You know, you never know at Kentucky in, uh, in November. Um, but uh, I, I hope we get really, really good weather. It's a shame we didn't have Keeneland in the spring this year because yeah. the weather was unbelievable. But, uh, you know, hopefully the fall goes well. And I'm, I'm excited to have it right there. Yeah. I'm really excited to have some, some good chances. So, <laughs> you know, hopefully, hopefully everything works out well. Well, uh, I would be remiss before I let you go if I didn't ask you with the Derby coming up. Can you believe it? It's so weird to say that September 5th is going to be the Kentucky Derby this year. First Saturday in September. We've been all keeping track of Tis the Law to see if he is the real deal. And by all appearances, it appears he is. What is your view? Um, I, I think that uh, he just seems to keep getting better. I mean, I, I, it's going to be hard for, you know, the, his numbers that he runs, you know, as far as if you're a, a gambler, um, doesn't, it appears like he's, uh, it is horse racing yes. you know, and he, and he is, um, he did get beat in the only time he ran there. Um, Good point. Was it, it was off track, wasn't it? That usually help over at Keeneland if it's an off track, uh, you know, horses that are, that, you know, it kind of is a, a great equalizer. If it rains yeah. there, it'll, a le level it out a little bit as opposed to if it's a sunny or hot day because it's pretty deep track um but uh, you know i got the local horse there with tom drury i'm, I'm excited for him yeah um, i don't know him very well but i did send him a text after the or actually left him a message after the race i congratulated him um that he's he's got such a great horse and then winning the bluegrass because that's art collector. I know from a, K a kentucky guy to win a race like that uh, it really meant a lot to him, and, and he oh, sure. he texted me back. He's a really nice guy. <laughs> well, I have to ask you then, uh, also, since he beat one of the Phillies that were all uh, very keen to see what she'll do in the Oaks, and so a skydiver who was second in the Bluegrass Stakes, between her and Gamin, what do you think? You know your, I mean, you know all your horses well, but you you also have something special, I think, with the with the ladies. So, what's your opinion of the two? Um, I can't see her getting beat. I think that, I ever uh, wins the Oaks. Yeah, it's uh, it's her track. Uh, the other Phillies fast. Um, and I know it's Bob Baffert. You know, he's, <laughs> he's uh, nearly unbeatable, especially with those kind of races and those kind of horses. But uh, she just, uh, I, I can't see her losing. No, I I got another question here for you. Uh, and uh, I think I already know your answer to it, but maybe I don't. We'll see. Opinions on the Euro Turf Sprinter Batash, and could he win the Breeders' Cup Turf Sprint? Uh, he's not going to be bound for nowhere. 
<laughs> good answer. Good answer. I'm not sure he's coming though. Uh, oh. For everything I'm reading, I, I'm not sure he's coming. Do, uh, do you have a read on what the what the European contingent is thinking, just from across the board, considering what's going on with travel and COVID and everything? No, I'm not even sure if the if the jockeys can come in. You know, um, that's crazy, right? Yeah. I, I mean, when were you? I can't remember the exact timeline, but with Royal Ascot, had you or what was what was it like knowing that you had to ship all you know your horses out? And did you already know when they were all booked to go that you would not be able to go with them? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, if 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 I would have went, um, I would have had to have a quarantine fourteen days, which would have nearly been impossible to come back and train uh -huh. all these things. Uh, right. You know, with a with a Kornstein instilled for me. So I uh, was fortunate that Blake Heap went over there for me and um, real lucky he did. You know, he, he knows my my system forever. And uh, he is and even going over there. He's gone over so many different times that, you know, he sort of had everything lined out. And uh, Kieran Fallon was there to get on the horses, which really, really made it great as well. But he need Kieran actually needed a uh, a direction from Blake as to how we do things instead of how he gets on the horse and does things the English way. Oh, what's the uh, what's the uh, disparity between for for those? If you there's have... a big difference. Okay, a big big difference the way um, they um, we don't train our horses as long as they do. You know, they'll be on their sets go out for an hour. You know, and. Uh, you know, I, I, our horses probably, or my, actually my horses, I should say our, my horses wouldn't be able to handle all that. They just kind of have to fall apart. They go, yeah, and over there they go hack in the countryside. And yeah. What, do you do you think there's something to be said for that? If, if that had been, I mean, the way that our racetracks are built, obviously, they're, they weren't built with that in mind. Um, having that opportunity to, to go work horses in that type of setting, I think um, that's why, you know, we hear about horses at Fair Hill who do do, uh, that type of work. Do you do you do you think that their way might be a little bit better, or do you think that you know both ways are fine? It's like comparing apples and oranges. Well, I train a lot of sprinters, and they train a lot for distance over there. Right. So sometimes I'll train twice in one day. You know, something you never hear of. Oh, that's great. That's a good point. Yeah. You know, like Kieran you know, sort of had some ideas and uh, Golden Pal, for example, he says, well, we're going to blow them out, you know, uh, the day before the race, three eighths of a mile. And I said, well, if you, you're going to blow me out of the race if you did something like that. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm glad it was Blake was there to make sure everything went accordingly. Oh my gosh. Well, it's so exciting. And I, well, how did you watch the rate? How did you watch uh, uh, when Capanelli won? Were you sitting there? How did you celebrate? Oh, I think, I'm, are you still there? Yeah, okay. Um, yeah. Uh, it's uh, the barn. It's actually, I wasn't sitting. I was standing at the barn. I was with Charlie O'Connor from Coolmore. And, uh, and he was actually jumping up and down with me. And we had the, all the barn was there watching the race. You know, everybody that worked so hard with uh, with all these horses of mine. And it was it was actually really nice this year to spend uh, to watch uh, a horse come through and win with all the people that make it happen. Oh gosh, right, absolutely. Because you can't take everybody with you uh, when, when you make the trip across the pond. Did you at least wear the top hat still? <laughs> I actually, I, I have that over in uh, England with my buddy, uh, Alex oh. Holt. I, I leave all that stuff over there with him. Oh, that's awesome. And uh, guys. But my son did. My, my oldest son. He did? He didn't have a top hat, but he had, uh, uh, he, he had a, uh, just a regular uh, hat on, like, what do they call it? Uh, fedoras. Oh, my he gosh. I love it. On, and he put a suit on, and he, he, he was sending me pictures from Miami. Uh, I love it. All ready for it. Oh my god. And he was drinking champagne. <laughs> you uh, hello, you had if, if there was ever a reason to drink champagne, winning a race over there would be it. Oh, you know, I got to thank you so much. I know you had such a long day today and but these horses are so exciting and I can hardly wait to see what they do come Future Stars Friday. In the meantime, we're going to be keeping our eyes on them and you and Again, it, the insight is invaluable. We appreciate it so much. No problem, because, you know, this time with you, I'm on water. 
but when I was on uh, the cocktails and uh, whatever right. it is with Brittany, I was, she, she said, I have to have whatever you want to drink. So I, I got one of Barbara's really nice bottles of wine. She gave me, and I, and I started walking around the barn and I, I was kind of waiting for a while. So I drank and I drank, I ended up finishing the whole bottle. And uh, I, I told Blake, I said, you got to tell that Brittany, I feel like shit today. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> she got you hold on. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's so funny. You have to bleep that part out. No, it's okay. No, so yeah, I mean, you could have drank tonight had you wanted to, but I mean, we're in solidarity with the water here. So it's there all you go. Good. Hopefully, you know, come Breeders' Cup, we will have a reason to toast to another victory um, or, or more than just one. Uh, again, Wesley, thank you so much for joining us here on the Future Stars Forecast. You definitely have some luminaries in that stable. All right, Ren, you take care of your family and tell Matt I said, pick the winners. I will do that. All right, you have a great night. Take care. Thank you everybody for joining us. That was Wesley Ward, amazing trainer, amazing horses in his stable. Keep an eye on them. Campanelli, Golden Pal, Fauci, uh, Future Stars Friday. It's just coming up. I mean, my gosh, we're flying through this year. We've got Kentucky Derby coming up. And then November 6th and 7th, the Breeders' Cup World Championships at Keeneland. I'm Red Carruthers. This has been your bonus edition of the Future Stars Forecast. I will see you next week.